Welcome to the Discovery Center of Idaho and our Matter Splatter virtual school program. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. So what is the Discovery Center of Idaho? The Discovery Center of Idaho is a science center located in Boise, Idaho. And a science center is a type of museum. What is a museum, you ask? Well, museums are spaces that tell stories about people, places, and things using objects or images. The stories we tell as a science center focus on how we understand the world around us, people, places, and things, through science, technology, engineering, and math. You've probably heard the acronym STEM before, but sometimes STEM is used so much that we forget that these areas of study all have different definitions and goals, even though they work very often together. Let's go through a quick reminder of what each part means before we jump into the meat of today's presentation. First of all, science is how we learn and understand the world around us by asking questions, observing, and experimenting. Technology is using science and engineering to make products and processes that make life better. Engineering is applying what we learn and understand about the world around us to solve problems or to make things. And math is simply the study of numbers, shapes, and patterns. Today, with Matter Splatter, we're going to explore science and technology, or the S and the T of STEM. Welcome to Matter Splatter! This one-of-a-kind exhibition is packed full of innovative hands-on exhibits and experiences. Built in-house by our highly skilled exhibition design and fabrication team, Matter Splatter encourages visitors of all ages to explore materials used to produce some of the most advanced technology in existence today. First of all, what is matter? Well, matter is anything that has weight and takes up space, or pretty much everything. Different types of matter can be identified by its properties, such as texture and feel, appearance, or the way it looks, its weight, or how heavy it is, its density, or how full it is, its buoyancy, or whether it floats or not, its magnetism, or if it attracts or pushes away magnets, or its solubility, or how well it stays together or easily falls apart. Matter comes in three basic forms. Solids and liquids are the ones we know the most about. The circles shaped into a square show how the molecules of solids are very organized to create a structure, like a piece of ice. And then you can see that it loses its structure when the ice melts into water or liquid. Gas is when the molecules are so far apart that they have very little structure at all, but still have properties of the liquid. Like clouds are still wet, but made out of water in a gas form. We've listed these different forms in order of increasing energy, or from cold to hot, to show how temperature or energy changes matter. This is important for scientists to understand so that they can properly control and use matter for technology. Matter in all its forms, solid, liquid, or gas, is made up of atoms. Atoms are everywhere. If you look around you, you won't see, but you're surrounded by billions and trillions of atoms because everything, even the air, is made up of tiny ultra-microscopic atoms. Let's look at these two different elements, helium and carbon. If you look in the middle of each, you will see red and green balls. These are representing protons and neutrons that form the nucleus or center of the atom. There really aren't little green or red balls in the middle of atoms, but it makes it easier for us to explain. So there's always an equal number of red balls as green balls, or an equal number of protons and neutrons in the center of each atom. Helium has two of each. Spinning around the nucleus like planets around a sun are little electrons. There are also an equal amount of electrons as there are protons. So in helium, there are two electrons, two protons, and two neutrons. So the atomic number that describes helium is two. 
Carbon has way more. Can you count the electrons and figure out how many protons and neutrons carbon has in its nucleus? Yep, six. So what's carbon's atomic number? You're right, it's six. This knowledge will come in handy later, I promise. Now that we know that all matter is made up of atoms, atoms can be combined to make molecules. If you add two atoms together, they can snap together to create something new, like a molecule. However, you cannot break apart a single atom any smaller, just like you can't remove the round connection points from an individual Lego. Now, remember how I said that knowing that helium's atomic number is two and carbon's atomic number is six would come in handy? Well, this is where that's helpful in the periodic table of elements. Eek, this can be super overwhelming. Do you see all the numbers at the tops of the squares? Yes? Well, now you know where you can find helium and carbon, right? Yep, there they are. This is the list of all the elements that we know of in the known universe. These are what all matter is made out of. Some combination of one, or two, or three of these elements. If you take one hydrogen and add it to two oxygen, you get H2O, otherwise known as water. Do you notice how there are gaps in this table? Well, these gaps are left because scientists suspect there are elements that have not yet been discovered that fit in there. Did you know that six elements were recently discovered just in 2016? So remember how technology is using science and engineering to make products and processes that make life better? Well, in order to do that, scientists need to really understand and be able to work with all of these elements. For example, lithium is a metal that we use to make batteries that power our phones. And carbon, a non-metal, is the basic element of all living things, like this tree or a dog or you. One of the things scientists use is their knowledge of each element's density. Earlier I said that density is how full something is. What I mean by that is how tightly packed its molecules are together. If it doesn't always mean it's heavier, just denser. Like if we took those Lego from earlier in the presentation and connected a bunch of them really closely together, they would be more dense than if we took the same amount of Lego and connected them together loosely. Let's watch this video of our exhibit on density. Can you see how one liquid is denser than the other so that they don't mix? The molecules of both liquids, even if they're mixed next to each other, can't combine because the denser liquid's molecules are so close together, they won't let them in. So before we move on to conductivity, let's explore how different elements and materials create friction. Now friction is really important to understand as we explore the rest of the concepts in today's class. Do this for me. Rub your hands together really hard, just like this. What happens? They get really hot, right? This is what we do when it's cold outside to warm up our hands. But what's happening? While our hands are rubbing together, the atoms in our hands are releasing energy. That released energy creates heat. The more energy that gets released, the hotter the hands get. Different elements create different textures that create different levels of friction. So let's watch our slippery slope work. On one track, we're placing a racer with PVC plastic on the bottom. And on the other track, we're placing a racer with cork on the bottom. So without watching, which one do you think would go faster and why? Are you ready? Let's watch and see. If you guessed that the PVC plastic would go faster, then you're correct. The plastic is smoother than the cork and creates less friction, which means it keeps going. The rougher texture of the cork slows the racer down and keeps it from making it to the end of the track. 
Have you ever noticed that when you wear dry pants while going down a slide, you go faster than if you go down with wet pants or even your bare skin? This is because of friction. Now let's go back to our hand warming exercise. Try putting some lotion on your hands and then rubbing them together to warm them up. It takes a lot longer for that energy to release. The lotion makes the texture of your skin smoother and less energy is released to create heat. When the lotion is all gone, the hands warm up again. So now that we have a better understanding of friction, let's move on to the next property of matter, conductivity. Another property of matter or elements is their conductivity. Conductivity just means how easily electricity can flow through the matter. Some elements conduct electricity more easier than others. Let's watch this video all about conductivity. What you see are two plastic tubes full of liquid and a dial that measures the electrical current flowing through them. When I put the copper receivers on either side, I can measure how much electricity is flowing through the tubes. The first tube is full of fresh water, which is made up of atoms of hydrogen and oxygen elements. The hydrogen and oxygen atoms allow the electricity to flow through, but at a pretty low rate. When I put the receivers on the tube of salt water, the electricity flows through at a very high rate. Why? Well, in addition to hydrogen and oxygen, there is now salt in the water, which is made up of atoms of sodium and chloride. Chloride is the element chlorine with an added electron, which makes it an ion. When you put salt in water, the water molecules pull the sodium and chlorine ions apart so that there's less friction, making it easier for the electricity to flow through. Kind of like how when we put lotion on our hands, we weren't able to create as much friction. So why does matter matter? The more scientists learn about matter, the better they can manipulate matter to solve problems, just like I've been saying all along. Now that we know all about the basic elements and what matter is, let's talk more about how scientists have used different forms of matter to create technology that makes our lives easier. We're going to start with something super duper cool, ferrofluids. So ferro is Latin for iron, and the elemental symbol for iron is Fe. So a liquid is a substance that has no fixed shape. So ferrofluids can be called liquid iron. This already sounds really cool. So what's so cool about iron? Well, the property of iron that ferrofluids take advantage of is this magnetism. Iron really likes magnets. A ferrofluid is made of tiny nanometer-sized particles of coated iron ore suspended in liquid. You'll notice in the video that when we move the magnet up against the container of ferrofluid, the particles become magnetized and create a really cool shape. As we pull the magnet away, the particles lose their magnetism and act like a liquid again. NASA scientists originally developed ferrofluids in the 1960s as a way to transport spacecraft fuel using magnetic fields. What problem do you think they were solving by creating ferrofluids? So here's another way scientists have used their understanding of elements and matter to do something really neat. It has to do with amorphous alloys and elastic collision. What the heck does that mean? Okay. Let's quickly break it down. Amorphous means without a structure or shape. An alloy is a combination of two different metals from the table of elements. Collision means to run into something. And elastic is when something bounces back. In the video, you'll notice that I'm raising a metal ball with a magnet. In the first tube, I drop the ball. The bottom is covered in rubber. The rubber absorbs the energy from the dropped ball, and so the ball can't bounce, kind of like a memory foam mattress. In the second tube, the metal at the bottom is made up of an amorphous alloy. 
An amorphous alloy has an atomic structure that is very disorderly or very disorganized, like a scrunched up ball of yarn, so that it can't absorb the energy of the ball. Rather, it gives the kinetic energy from the dropping ball back to the ball at almost the same rate, making it bounce much more. In the exhibit, visitors can test how the atomic structures of the other metals cause the ball to bounce. The more elastic the collision, the more it bounces. The less the ball bounces, the more inelastic the collision. The atomic structure of each of the materials determines how much kinetic energy is given back to the ball. So U.S. tennis star Andre Agassi used the head liquid metal radical tennis racket in 2003 when he was ranked number one in the world. This racket featured an amorphous metal alloy or mixture that caused the ball that hit against it to be returned faster and harder than balls hitting against rackets made out of other materials. So here's a great point to pause and reflect as a class or a group on your own and ask this question. Can you think of an invention that would make your life easier or more interesting? Extra bonus points if you can use some of the stuff we talked about today. So we just covered a lot of stuff and learned a lot of things with really long and very unfamiliar words for some of us. So let's do a little review to see what we remember. Question one, what are the parts of an atom? Is it electric, positive, and neutral? Are they electrons, protons, and neutrons? Or are they electroid, protein, and neutron? Ooh, what do you guys think? You can ask your friends, see if you guys come up with together. Are you ready? B, electron, proton, and neutron. Okay, let's see what the next question is. Why is it important for scientists to study and understand matter? A, so they can be real smarty pants, so they can learn how to manipulate or alter matter, or because it helps create innovations and solve problems. Ooh, what do you guys think? It's both B and C, so they can learn how to manipulate or alter matter, and because it helps create innovations and solve problems. Okay, which property of matter describes how full something is? Is it density, weight, or buoyancy? Are you ready? Density, it's how full something is. Sometimes it can be really dense, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be heavier. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. We hope you've been inspired to learn more about matter and the elements and what everything around you is made of. The exhibition Matter Splatter is on display at the Discovery Center of Idaho through May. Grab your parents or grandparents or friends or neighbors and tell them all about the amazing things you've learned about today. We hope you can visit us in Boise before the exhibition leaves. If you have any questions, suggestions, or want to tell us something cool that you know about matter or maybe a project you're working on, ask your teacher to share it with us at education at dcidaho.org.